1984, Part 2, Chapter 4. Winston looked round the shabby little room above Mr. Charrington's shop. Beside the window, the enormous bed was made up with ragged blankets and a coverless bolster. The old-fashioned clock with the twelve-hour face was ticking away on the mantelpiece. In the corner, on the gate-leg table, the glass paperweight which he had bought on his last visit gleamed softly out of the half-darkness. In the fender was a battered tin oil stove, a saucepan, and two cups provided by Mr. Charrington. Winston lit to the burner and set the pan of water to boil. He had brought an envelope full of victory coffee and some sacharine tablets. The clock hand said 1720. It was 1920, really. She was coming at 1930. Folly, folly, his heart kept saying. Conscious, gratuitous, suicidal folly. Of all the crimes that a party member could commit, this one was the least possible to conceal. Actually, the idea first floated in his head in the form of a vision of the glass paperweight mirrored by the surface of the gate-leg table. As he had foreseen, Mr. Charrington had made no difficulty about letting the room. He was obviously glad of the few dollars it would bring him. Nor did he seem shocked, or become offensively knowing when it was made clear that Winston wanted the room for the purpose of a love affair. Instead, he looked into the middle distance and spoke in generalities, with so delicate an air as to give the impression that he had become partially invisible. Privacy, he said, was a very valuable thing. Everyone wanted a place where they could be alone occasionally. And when they had such a place, it was only common courtesy in anyone else who knew of it to keep his knowledge to himself. He even, seeming almost to fade out of existence as he did so, added that there were two entries into the house, one of them through the backyard, which gave onto an alley. Under the window, somebody was singing. Winston peeped out, secure in the protection of the muslin curtain. The June sun was still high in the sky, and the sun filled the court below. A monstrous woman, a monstrous woman, solid as a Norman pillar, with brawny red forearms and a sacking apron strapped about her middle, was stumping to and fro between a wash tub and a clothesline, pegging out a series of square white things which Winston recognised as baby's diapers. Whenever her mouth was not caught with clothes pegs, she was singing in a powerful contralto. It was only an hopeless fancy, it passed like an April dye. But look and a word and the dreams they stirred, they have stolen my heart away. The tune had been haunting London for weeks past. It was one of countless similar songs published for the benefit of the proles by a subsection of the music department. The words of these songs were composed without any human intervention whatever on an instrument known as a versificator, but the woman sang so tunefully as to turn the dreadful rubbish into an almost pleasant sound. He could hear the woman singing, and the scrapes of her shoes on the flagstones, and the cries of the children in the street, and somewhere in the far distance a faint roar of traffic. And yet, the room seemed curiously silent, thanks to the absence of a telescreen. Folly, 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 he thought again. It was inconceivable that they could frequent this place more than a few weeks without being caught. But the temptation of having a hiding place that was truly their own, indoors and near at hand, had been too much for the both of them. For some time after their visit to the church belfry, it had been impossible to arrange meetings. Working hours had been drastically increased in anticipation of hate week. It was more than a month distant, but the enormous, complex preparations that it entailed were throwing extra work onto everybody. Finally, both of them managed to secure a free afternoon on the same day. They had agreed to go back to the clearing in the wood, on the evening beforehand, they met briefly in the street. As usual, Winston hardly looked at Julia as they drifted towards one another in the crowd. But from the short glance he gave her, it seemed to him that she was paler than usual. It's all off, she murmured as soon as she judged it safe to speak. Tomorrow, I mean. What? Tomorrow. I can't come. Why not? Oh, the usual reason. It started early this time. For a moment, he was violently angry. During the month that he had known her, the nature of his desire had changed. At the beginning, there had been little true sensuality in it. Their first lovemaking had been simply an act of the will. But after the second time, it was different. The smell of her hair, the taste of her mouth, the feeling of her skin seemed to have gotten inside him, or into the air all around him. She had become a physical necessity, 
something that he not only wanted, but felt that he had a right to. When she said that she couldn't come, he had the feeling that she was cheating him. But just at this moment, the crowd pressed them together and their hands accidentally met. She gave the tips of his fingers a quick squeeze that seemed to invite, not desire, but affection. It struck him that when one lived with a woman, this particular disappointment must be a normal reoccurring event, and a deep tenderness such as he had not felt for her before suddenly took hold of him. He wished that they were a married couple of ten years standing. He wished that he were walking through the streets with her, just as they were doing now, but openly, without fear, talking of trivialities and buying odds and ends for the household. He wished above all that they had some place where they could be alone together, without feeling the obligation to make love every time they met. It was not actually at that moment, but some moment on the following day that the idea of renting Mr. Charrington's room had occurred to him. When he suggested it to Julia, she had agreed with unexpected readiness. Both of them knew that it was lunacy. It was as though they were intentionally stepping nearer their graves. As he sat waiting on the edge of the bed, he thought again of the cellars of the Ministry of Love. It was curious how that predestined horror moved in and out of one's consciousness. There it lay, fixed in future times, preceding death as surely as ninety-nine precedes one hundred. One could not avoid it, but one could perhaps postpone it. And yet instead, every now and again, by a conscious, willful act, one chose to shorten the interval before it happened. At this moment, there was a quick step on the stairs. Julia burst into the room. She was carrying a tool bag of coarse brown canvas, such as he had sometimes seen her carrying to and fro at the ministry. He started forward to take her in his arms, but she disengaged herself rather hurriedly, partly because she was still holding the tool bag. Half a second, she said. Just let me show you what I've brought. Did you bring some of that filthy victory coffee? I thought you would. You can chuck it away again, because we shan't be needing it. Look here! She fell onto her knees, threw open the bag, and tumbled out some spanners and a screwdriver that filled up the top part of it. Underneath were a number of neat paper packets. The first packet that she passed to Winston had a strange, yet vaguely familiar feeling. It was filled with some kind of heavy, sand-like stuff which yielded whenever you touched it. It isn't sugar, he said. Real sugar, not sacharine sugar. And here's a loaf of bread, proper white bread, not our bloody stuff. And a little pot of jam, and here's a tin of milk. But look, this is the one I'm really proud of. I had to wrap a bit of sacking round it, because... But she did not need to tell him why she had wrapped it. The smell was already filling the room, a rich, hot smell which seemed like an emanation from his early childhood, but which one did occasionally meet with, even now, blowing down a passageway before a door slammed, or diffusing itself mysteriously in a crowded street, sniffed for an instant, and then lost again. "'It's coffee,' he murmured. "'Real coffee. It's inner party coffee. There's a whole kilo here,' she said. How did you manage to get hold of these things? It's all in a party stuff. There's nothing those swine don't have. Nothing. But of course, waiters and servants and people pinch things, and look, I got a little packet of tea as well. Winston had squatted down beside her. He tore open a corner of the packet. It's real tea, not blackberry leaves. There's been a lot of tea about lately. There's been a lot of tea about lately. They've captured India or something, she said vaguely. But listen, dear, I want you to turn your back on me for three minutes. Go and sit on the other side of the bed, don't go too near the window, and don't turn around till I tell you. Winston gazed abstractedly through the muslin curtain. Down in the yard, the red-armed woman was still marching to and fro between the wash-tub and the line. She took two more pegs out of her mouth and sang with deep feeling. They say that time heals all things, they say you can always forget, but the smile and the tears across the years, they twist my heartstrings yet. She knew the whole drivelling thing by heart, it seemed. Her voice floated upwards with the sweet summery air, very tuneful, charged with a sort of happy melancholy. One had the feeling that she would have been perfectly content if the June evening had been endless and the supply of clothes inexhaustible to remain there for a thousand years, 
pegging out diapers and singing rubbish. It struck him as a curious fact that he had never heard a member of the party singing alone and spontaneously. It would even have seemed slightly unorthodox, a dangerous eccentricity, like talking to oneself. Perhaps it was only when people were somewhere near the starvation level that they had anything to sing about. You can turn round now, said Julia. He turned round, and for a second, almost failed to recognise her. What he had actually expected to see was her naked. But she was not naked. The transformation that had happened was much more surprising than that. She had painted her face. She must have slipped into some shop in the proletarian quarters and bought herself a complete set of makeup materials. Her lips were deeply reddened, her cheeks rouged, her nose powdered. There was even a touch of something under the eyes to make them brighter. It was not skillfully done, but Winston's standards in such matters were not high. He had never before seen or imagined a woman of the party with cosmetics on her face. The improvement in her appearance was startling. With just a few dabs of colour in the right places, she had become not only very much prettier, but, above all, far more feminine. Her short hair and boyish overalls merely added to the effect. As he took her in his arms, a wave of synthetic violets flooded his nostrils. He remembered, he remembered the half-darkness of a basement kitchen and a woman's cavernous mouth. It was the very same scent that she had used, but at the moment it did not seem to matter. Scent, too! he said. Yes, dear. Scent too. And you know what I'm going to do next? I'm going to get a hold of a real woman's frock from somewhere and wear it instead of these bloody trousers. I'll wear silk stockings and high-heeled shoes. In this room, I'm going to be a woman, not a party comrade. They flung their clothes off and climbed into the huge mahogany bed. It was the first time that he had stripped himself naked in her presence. Until now, he had been too much ashamed of his pale and meagre body, with the varicose veins standing out on his calves and the discoloured patch over his ankle. There were no sheets, but the blanket they lay on was threadbare and smooth, and the size and the springiness of the bed astonished both of them. It's sure to be full of bugs, but who cares, said Julia. One never saw a double bed nowadays, except in the homes of the proles. Winston had occasionally slept in one in his boyhood, Julia had never been in one before, so far as she could remember. Presently, they fell asleep for a little while. When Winston woke up, the hands of the clock had crept round nearly to nine. He did not stir, because Julia was sleeping with her hand in the crook of his arm. Most of her makeup had transferred itself to his own face, or the bolster, but a light stain of rouge still brought out the beauty of her cheekbone. A yellow ray from the sinking sun fell across the foot of the bed, and lighted up the fireplace, where the water in the pan was boiling fast. Down in the yard, the woman had stopped singing, but the faint chants of children floated in from the street. He wondered vaguely whether in the abolished past it had been normal experience to lie in bed like this in the cool summer evening. A man and a woman, with no clothes on, making love when they chose, talking of what they chose, not feeling any compulsion to get up, simply lying there, and listening to the peaceful sounds outside. Surely there could never have been a time where that seemed ordinary. Julia woke up, rubbed her eyes, and raised herself on her elbow to look at the oil stove. Half that water's boiled away, she said. I'll get up and make some coffee in another moment. We've got an hour. What time do they cut the lights off at your flats? Twenty-three thirty. It's twenty-three at the hostel, but you have to get there earlier than that because- Ha! Get out, you filthy brute! She suddenly twisted herself over the bed, seized a shoe from the floor, and sent it hurtling into the corner with a boyish jerk of her arm, exactly as he had seen her fling the dictionary at Goldstein that morning during the two minutes' hate. What was it? he said, in surprise. A rat! I saw him sticking his beastly nose out of the wainscoting. There's a hole down there. I gave him a good fright, anyway. Rats, murmured Winston, in this room. They're all over the place, said Julia, indifferently, as she lay down again. We've, we've even got them in the kitchen at the hostel. Some parts of London are swarming with them. Did you know they attack children? Yes, they do. In some of these suites, a woman daren't leave a baby alone for two minutes. It's the great huge brown ones that do it. And the nasty thing is the brutes always... Don't go on, said Winston, with his eyes tightly shut. Dearest, you've gone quite pale. What's the matter? 
Did they make you feel sick? Of all horrors in the world, a rat? She pressed herself against him and wound her limbs around him, as though to reassure him with the warmth of her body. He did not reopen his eyes immediately. For several moments he had the feeling of being in a nightmare which had reoccurred from time to time throughout his life. It was always very much the same. He was standing in front of a wall of darkness, and on the other side of it there was something unendurable, something too dreadful to be faced. In the dream, his deepest feeling was always one of self-deception, because he did know in fact what was behind the wall of darkness. With a deadly effort, like wrenching a piece out of his own brain, he could even have dragged the thing into the open. He always woke up without discovering what it was, but somehow it connected with what Julia had been saying when he cut her short. I'm sorry, he said. It's nothing. I don't I don't like rats, that's all. Don't worry, dear. We're not going to have those filthy brutes in here. I'll stuff the hole with a bit of sacking before we go, and next time we come here I'll bring some plaster and bung it up properly. Already, the black, instant panic was half forgotten. Feeling slightly ashamed of himself, he sat up against the bed head. Julia got out of the bed, pulled on her overalls, and made the coffee. The smell that rose from the saucepan was so powerful and exciting that they shut the window, lest anybody outside should notice it and become inquisitive. What was even better than the taste of the coffee was the silky texture given to it by the sugar, a thing Winston had almost forgotten after years of sacherine. With one hand in her pocket, and a piece of bread and jam in the other, Julia wandered about the room, glancing indifferently at the bookcase, pointing out the best way of repairing the gate leg table, plumping herself down in the ragged armchair to see if it was comfortable, and examining the absurd twelve-hour clock with a sort of tolerant amusement. She brought the glass paperweight over to the bed to have a look at it in the better light. He took it out of her hand, fascinated as always by the soft, rain-watery appearance of the glass. "'What is it, do you think?' said Julia. "'I don't think it was anything. I mean, I don't think it was ever put to any use. It's a little chunk of history that they've forgotten to alter. It's a message from a hundred years ago, if one knew how to read it. "'And that picture over there?' She nodded at the engraving on the opposite wall. "'Would that be a hundred years old?' "'More.' Two hundred, I dare say. One can't tell. It's impossible to discover the age of anything nowadays. She went over to look at it. Here's where that brute stuck his nose out, she said, kicking at the wainscoting immediately below the picture. What's this place? I've seen it before somewhere. It's a church, or at least it used to be. St. Clement's Danes, its name was. The fragment of rhyme that Mr. Charrington had taught him came back into his head, and he added, half nostalgically, Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clemens. To his astonishment, she clapped the line, You owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. When will you pay me, say the bells of Old Bailey. I can't remember how it goes on after that. But anyway, it ends up, Here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes the chopper to chop off your head. It was like the two halves of a countersign. But there must be another line after the bells of Old Bailey. Perhaps it could be dug out of Mr. Charrington's memory if he were suitably prompted. Who taught you that? he said. My grandfather. He used to say it to me when I was a little girl. He was vaporised when I was eight. At any rate, he disappeared. I wonder what eleven was, she added inconsequently. I've seen oranges. They're kind of round, yellow fruit with a thick skin. I can remember lemons, said Winston. They were quite common in the fifties. They were so sour that it set your teeth on edge even to smell them. I bet that picture's got bugs behind it, said Julia. I'll take it down and give it a good clean some day. I suppose it's almost time we're leaving. I must start washing this paint off. What a bore. I'll get the lipstick off your face afterwards. Winston did not get up for a few minutes more. The room was darkening. He turned over towards the light and lay gazing into the glass paperweight. The inexhaustibly interesting thing was not the fragment of coral, but the interior of the glass itself. There was such a depth of it, and yet it was almost as transparent as air. It was as though the surface of the glass had been the arch of the sky, enclosing a tiny world with its atmosphere complete. 
he had the feeling that he could get inside it, and that in fact he was inside it, along with the mahogany bed and the gate-leg table, and the clock, and the steel engraving, and the paperweight itself. The paperweight was the room he was in, and the coral was Julia's life and his own, fixed in a sort of eternity at the heart of the crystal. Thank you so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed, and if you did, do subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you know when the next video goes live. Um, like, share, and all that jazz. And if you really want to support me, um, go to my Patreon. The link's in the bio. See you next time. Bye-bye.